The title of the talk, I think, is uh, Saving Investigative Journalism. I don't pretend to be the savior. But uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what I'm doing and how I got there, and then I'd like to really open it up to questions, uh, because I think that's more energizing for everybody, and I'm at the end of my rope. But uh, when I first walk, walked into a newsroom, it was almost, it was more than 40 years ago, and I had no idea what I wanted to do. But I walked into the newsroom, and I was immediately uh, just enchanted by what was happening. This, the pounding of the typewriters in those days, the romance of being a reporter, the smoke-filled rooms, the bottle of whiskey in the bottom drawer. And it was really a different world. Uh, it was the newspapers were put out in those days the way they'd been put out, you know, for a long time. And there'll be a quiz later why there were paste pots and spikes and straight edges on editors' desks, because a lot of you won't have a clue what I'm talking about. But what that meant, and I won't go into it, but it was really a different world. So I have bridged uh, the old world, the ancien regime, to where we are today, really on the cutting edge of trying to really grasp what's happening with technology. My career has been very fortunate in terms of the things I've done. A few months after I came to the New York Times as a copy boy, uh, I was part of the team to put together as an editorial assistant the Pentagon Papers, which is one of the most you know, memorable and his truly historic uh, stories in the United States. And it was really a remarkable education for me being part of that team and being part of the team that was actually cloistered in the Hilton Hotel in New York. It was a secret uh, project because the, the, the papers, the Pentagon Papers, were top secret. And everybody who was involved in working on that risked going to jail because it was, it was this, this Espionage Act still existed. And there was the potential for treason, uh, which no one knew. I don't think I understood that because I literally slept with the Pentagon Papers because they were in the room I was in, in two big filing cabinets. And part of my job was to know where to find certain documents for the reporters. But that team effort, that engagement in that story really shaped my values. And after that, I, I had a passion for journalism and storytelling that has stuck with me today. And that's why I'm still doing what I'm doing at a time when many people have, at sort of my career experience have, have really left journalism in the States. It's been a very difficult journey the last 10 years. Great journalists were paid to leave newspapers. Sometimes they went to other newspapers. A lot of them are out of the business. There are about half the journalists now in the United States working for traditional media uh, than there were even five to eight years ago. And what that means, and I'm now in the Bay Area in San Francisco, is that so many things are not being covered. So many investigations are not being done. If you think about it, there are, at a paper like the San Francisco Chronicle, when I got there in 2002, there were about 500 journalists. Now there are 130. The San Jose Mercury News, which was a very fine newspaper and part of the same chain that owned the Philadelphia Inquirer, had about 400 journalists. They had about 70 people just covering the technology sector. Now they have less than 100 people in their newsroom. So what's not being covered? What's not being reported? What's not being investigated? Which led me to the Center for Investigative Reporting. And when I got there at the beginning of 2008, it was a nonprofit. I'd never worked in that kind of environment. Uh, the Center for Investigative Reporting, as you heard, was founded in 1977 and had done a lot of very good journalism, but usually it was small uh, because getting funding from foundations and other individuals is not easy. But it, it, it did sustain itself and it did a lot of work with 60 Minutes, if you're familiar with that broadcast show, or, or Frontline. It did a lot of documentary work. But when I got there, I had been extraordinarily frustrated by the disconnect that I was part of, really, and witnessed and was sacked a couple of times between what I would call the creative engine of, news, of journalism, which were the journalists in the newsroom, and the business side. They were not in alignment. The values of corporate media, and there's nothing wrong with making money, but they were driven by one thing, really, keeping the profit margin at a high level and, and increasing it every year so that the stock price would go up. It worked for a long time. American newspaper companies, I'm not familiar with the margins here, or what they used to be, but could be 25, 30 percent or higher of profit, uh, which is a lot of money if you know anything about business. And all of us would love to have about half of that in our own investments. And when the internet came in and the erosion of profit began, as you heard, the, the, the really the, the strategy was not any strategy, it was downsizing. It was eliminate the people who were the best journalists. So I personally was extraordinarily frustrated. When I went to CIR, 
I had a very clear vision of what I wanted to do and I had no idea how to do it. But what I wanted to do was really take advantage of the world we're in today in terms of technology and, and then take the technology and create a team, an organization that could push stories out on every existing platform. The core of the organization is a story. When I was a young journalist or for a long time in my career, you put a story in a newspaper. If you worked on a radio station, it was on the radio. If you worked for a TV station, it was on, you know, on, your, on broadcast. Today, you could take that same story and think about how you could take the core story and with a team or through collaborations with other news, other news organizations, create that story on multiple platforms. So the core investigation, and that's what we are, we're doing unique investigative reporting. We're not a news organization you know, chasing the news every day. But what we've been able to do, and I was able to get the funding for it because it was a, not a, a unique idea in the sense that no one else had thought of it, but take a story, and if you think of the spokes of the wheel, in the center of the spoke is the, is the hub, and the hub is the story, and every spoke is a different platform. So you have that core story. It, it might be generated by a radio reporter, but generally it's from print background, deep investigative work, and you're getting it out, the same story, on a, uh, through radio, through broadcast, through multimedia. You heard about, I think, animation, uh, through interactive data. Well, we're actually doing all that. And as a small organization with a staff of 32 people, we can partner in the United States with every major news organization simultaneously on a story we bring to them. So we are actually creating audience for our stories of multiple millions of people on all these different platforms. And we've been able, as a small organization, to control the release of a story. We can multitask, multi-purpose the story, repurpose the same story, <laughs> And we've sort of shattered the concept in some places of exclusivity, which for a journalist is like you know, the holy grail. I want the story, it's my story. But what we've found is that if you have a really good story, you can get it out and control the distribution almost simultaneously on all these platforms, not only in a geography of, a, say, a metro market like Melbourne, but on a national scale. And a lot of the things we've done I would not have imagined has, have worked, would have worked as well as they have. But it's happening. You know, we'll have a st we had a story last week, I think it was last week, in the no, 10 days ago, in the build-up to 9-11 about suspicious activity reports in the States, which have to do with gathering of data and information on citizens and how they're sort of, you get into a system. Uh, and some of it is really mundane. It's absolutely absurd, a lot of the things that are happening. But that story was broadcast nationally on NPR, our N ABC. It was broadcast nationally on, on, a public tel on uh, the news hour, which you get. It was in major newspapers in the United States. It was on I don't know how many websites. We had an animation. We had an interactive graphics and data that were pushed out to multiple websites. And we also distributed it in a very non-traditional way through Twitter and Facebook using social media. So what we've done is been able to create a model which may not save journalism or investigative reporting, but it's innovating. And it's, and it's a new kind of way to think. And we're not the only ones doing it. But it's happened. Now, you heard we've grown. Uh, it's true. 90% uh, of our funding now comes from big foundations. Uh, it's, our budget has grown in three and a half years from around a million dollars to almost $5 million. We have 32 people. When I got to CIR, uh, the office was a, 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 a loft and a stable, and we had no heat and no air conditioning in the, in the uh, summer. And, uh, it looked like uh, Bob Cratchit's shop because the reporters would work with little cut-off mittens and beanies <laughs> when it was cold. And in the summer, I'd send them home because literally it would be about over 40 degrees, 45 degrees. And now we have a, a nice office. Actually, it's too small because we've grown. But the model is astonishingly fragile. I can't stand here <clears throat> and tell you with all the success, and we've gotten a tremendous amount of positive attention in the States for what we've done in the model and the distribution we've had and, and the innovation. I can't tell you standing here that we'll be at the same staffing levels in six months. So what I've evolved into, rather than being an editor and a journalist, even though that's sort of the core of who I am, is really a publisher and an almost evangelical about this model and the value of the, of the reporting. I absolutely believe that, you know, journalism and investigative reporting are sort of crucial to democracy. Uh, we, we, in the United States, there are people who believe in that. 
and I think it's really important as these organizations evolve that we're not seen as being partisan from the right or the left, that we're really trying to be objective as, and objective, objectivity is not easy, and we know we're going to be challenged. But I think the most valuable asset any journalism organization can have is its credibility. At a time when there's this incredible overload of information that we're all bombarded by, how do you, you know, figure out what's really happening? Uh, it's, as we go forward, what we need to do in our organization and others, because we're journalists, is bring in people who can help us understand how to market and brand and generate revenue. We actually charge for our content, which no nonprofit in the States had done, because we wanted to establish with for-profit organizations that our work had value. We also had to create multiple streams of revenue to create the river that will support us. There are some individual donors who have given us a lot of money who believe in the role of the press and democracy, and they're not telling us what to cover or what not to cover. It's really crucial that our funders have no influence over what we're doing, and it's happening. Whether it's going to be sustainable, whether it's going to save investigative reporting, I don't know. But the, the thing that's really exciting to me <coughs> is that the ability to generate your own audience and, in a sense, jump over the publisher because of the Internet and create local, regional, national, and international news from an organization like ours is alive. It's happening. We work with ethnic media in the States. We, our stories are translated into multiple languages. It, it's just, you know, it, it's, it can be done, but you really need quality journalists and you have to establish the credibility. At the same time, you have to be able to keep wooing and almost in a political way in terms of dealing with foundations, woo them to keep funding you. It's a very difficult task. Uh, I'm driven by the same passions I think I had as a young reporter when I was a foreign correspondent, which is always a story. And if we're successful, what we'll be able to do is create an environment that will nurture and protect and allow really talented journalists to do what they can do. And I think it's very important. Uh, and, you know, that's why we're doing what we're doing.